Good morning. Sorry, that was kind of a mouthful, right? So, can never make those bios simple because too simple and it doesn't sound good, too complicated, and then you get jarbled. Um, so I'm assuming pretty much everybody here, this is kind of the beginner biomed track, are all of you fairly recently, either recently diagnosed or kind of new to biomed? Can we get kind of a show of hands? All right, sounds good. And then is there any uh, old, old, tired, worn out road warriors who have just coming in for another set of eyes kind of thing, Be, been around the block a long time? All right, fair enough, because you get a, a kind of a variety. So those of you that have been around, this might be a little bit easy uh, or a little bit basic, but sometimes going back to fundamentals is never a good, uh, never a bad thing. Uh, in terms of the talk, I also wanted just to give credit where credit was due. This was initially uh, to be given by a PA in the office, uh, Nicole Rincon, but she's unfortunately was sick and wasn't able to make it today, so I was stepped in to try to help her out. So, uh, but hopefully, uh, I'm not as cute as she is, but hopefully it'll suffice. So uh, anyway, so let's get started. So uh, this is sort of the standard disclaimer. And as you are all aware, uh, when you go and you see your developmental behavioral pediatrician, your neurologist, uh, you know, whomever, you know, they're basically very quick, or at least my experience has been that they're very quick to tell you pretty much there's nothing you can do. Um, you know, uh, go into therapy, do all of that sort of stuff, and um, thanks for coming, right? And they really have little to nothing to offer you. Um, and that's uh, where we, or people like us, try to step in and, and uh, we politely uh, disagree with that assessment. But nevertheless, you know, uh, pretty much, the treatments and some of the things that we're going to be discussing are, and biomed by definition is still not considered conventional medicine. Really the only things that are uh, FDA approved are antipsychotics uh, for bad behavior, uh, unfortunately. So just sort of that standard disclaimer there. Um, so when you go to a biomed practitioner, uh, us, you know, sort of obviously a little bit more, a little bit more biased towards kind of what we do, but pretty much across the board, um, you know, the, te the first appointments tend to be rather long. They're about 90 minutes for most of us, 60 to 90 minutes, depending on the doc. Certainly in our office, it's about 90. Uh, and we try to really get a comprehensive history because this is really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we need to look at, you know, your pregnancy history, you know, what sort of exposures, uh, did you have a toxic burden, did you have, you know, did you have tons of ultrasounds, did you get a lot of vaccines, did you have amalgams, did you, you know, what was that that might have set the stage for later on uh, the line having, you know, a child that's affected. Um, birth and early life history is going to be reviewed as well. Um, common uh, scenarios that we do tend to hear fairly regularly is going to be the uh, proverbial child who is born via cesarean section, maybe doesn't have the opportunity to get vaginal uh, flora into the gut, for example, to start that process on the right footing. Uh, then because of some immune imbalance, maybe starts getting eczema, uh, some ear infections, has a number of antibiotics, has reflux, goes on a Zantac or another PPI. And so these sorts of stories come up over and again. You know, then they're getting six, you know, or whatever vaccines at their two, four, and six month, you know, well baby checkups. Uh, and so these things tend to sort of be cumulative and add up. So we're trying to review that to see if there's certain things that might have set the stage for, again, and a later diagnosis. Uh, with the developmental history and milestones, again, trying to review that, getting a sense of was this a regressive autism, was this just a slowly progressive uh, sort of situation, uh, was this more of a congenital, and sort of getting a sensibility of that. Um, looking at other medical disorders, uh, so these comorbid conditions can be very important and they can be clues for us to help guide us because, you know, the, the, the puzzle piece is the symbol for autism for a, uh, a reason, oops, sorry, uh, and there's no two kids are alike and that's at once the interesting and the challenging thing for all of us, yourselves included, and that's one thing if you're new to biomed, I would encourage you to take some of the things that you're going to hear, um, I think a little bit with a grain of salt in the sense that sometimes I think, you know, you read on the internet, oh, my child, this one intervention and the miracle happened, or this one intervention and the miracle happened, and you can get families that unfortunately, because we're so desperate, bouncing from sort of one miracle cure to the next, and not to say that you shouldn't look in and try those things, but sometimes doing a more systematic and kind of sticking to fundamentals, I think, becomes very important. And uncovering the clues and having some of those comorbid conditions can some, or 
looking at that can be helpful for us. So for example, if I have a child who comes in and there's a very strong family history of asthma, allergies, uh, you know, eczema, you know, this sort of thing, um, and then the child had similar sorts of issues, you know, that's a kid maybe that I'm going to look a little bit more deeply into the immune dysfunction or an immune imbalance as opposed to none of those are there. Not to say that it's an impossibility that there's immune imbalance because that's, there's nothing impossible with these kids, unfortunately. But maybe that's not where I'm going to begin initially, or I'm not going to lean as heavily, versus if I have a kid who has a lot of gastrointestinal problems, and, it, and on it goes, right? So that's where those comorbids kind of can come in to give us a clue in terms of where we might want to start, um, you know, uh, diving deeper in terms of uh, more specific testing and so forth. Um, we'll try to look over uh, previous medical records, uh, especially uh, you know things that are relevant in terms of the biomedical piece of it. Um, we're obviously not the ABA therapists or the psychologists, so some of that is helpful, but not necessarily what we do. It's not our wheelhouse as such. Um, we're generally more, what's gonna be more helpful for us is any previous lab testing or other things related to the biology that you've done. And so it's always important to bring in or have, uh, we have you ideally load things ahead of time and I'll review even before I see you try to go through the things that you've done uh, previously so that we can hopefully pick off from or pick up from there and then also you know certain things are going to be redundant so obviously we, we don't want to you know re keep repeating the same testing um, and so, you know, this is going to be, you know, whether it's the blood, urine, hair, uh, other sort of MRIs, EEGs, uh, things like that. And then also getting a sensibility of, uh, you know, what happened, you know, good, bad or otherwise or indifferent. Um, and then, you know, trying to sort of the challenge for those of us who are, do this is trying to uncover stones that haven't been turned over yet and trying to figure out, you know, the mystery. Because this is, in a certain sense, there are mysteries, and each kid is an individual mystery. And so there's no two that are alike. I mean, the old cliche is once you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism. And they're all so, so very different. And, and even siblings. I have siblings that will come and see me and will do a, an intervention, the diet or the B12 shots or whatever it may be, and one responds and one doesn't, you know, and here we have the same womb, the same diet, the same genes, you know, and yet here it is. So that, that's, it's, that can be frustrating for all parties, you know, uh, but so then sometimes we have to cobble together where you've been and then try to pick up from there. Um, we'll do a targeted physical examination, and again, uh, obviously, you know, there may not be huge, huge things that have been missed, presumably, by the pediatrician that you see, the neurologist you see, the allergist you see, the, you know, gastroenterologist, you know, those sorts of things. You know, sometimes we'll look for other more subtle clues, you know, looking for things like a keratosis pilaris, the kind of the goose bumpy skin, and maybe that's a gluten marker or a vitamin A or omega imbalance, things like this. Uh, uh, mark lines on the nails for zinc or other mineral deficiencies, uh, you know, opacity of the teeth, looking for maybe a gluten or some of those sorts of issues, sparsity of the hair, again, for thyroid or for gluten. You know, some of these sorts of little things that maybe the more conventionally trained doctors aren't necessarily going to be looking for. It's the kind of thing that if you don't know to see it, you won't see it. Uh, it's kind of like if you've ever learned a new word and some, suddenly you see that word everywhere and you're like, how did I not see this word previously? This is very strange. It's you didn't have the eyes to see. And so there's unfortunately, because we're not trained in any of this, um, unless we take specific training after the fact, your regular doctors won't necessarily see some of these findings or, or make much of them. Um, and then, you know, after we do those things, we try to kind of look at what, you know, it's going to be our most likely problem. So are we having, for example, the mitochondrial dysfunction? Uh, the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cells, and obviously um, the, uh, the, the, t the tissue that uses the most energy, your brain, uh, for example, you know, probably most relevant for us here, um, if, if that's affected, then obviously that it's not going to work well. And so, you know, those sorts of things, again, inflammation and allergies, uh, you know, is that a driver, uh, various oxidative stress and methylation. So again, we're looking at a pro-oxidative state, sort of a pro-inflammatory state, potentially in this child's brain. And so in that sense, and then depending on what areas of the brain are most severely affected, then that will potentially manifest as the various symptoms, uh, whether that's the stimming, whether that's the poor coordination, and, and on it goes. 
Um, any sort of uh, suspicion, again, mostly from the history, uh, typically, uh, of any kinds of problems with toxicity. Um, and I'm going to be giving on Sunday morning a lecture, kind of a 30,000-foot overview of some just kind of detox and genetics and kind of prenatal and so forth. So we'll get into it a little bit here, but there are certainly other lectures relating to that. Um, and actually at our booth, uh, we also have a mito dysfunction and a tox kind of screening test and some stuff. If you're interested, you could always come by and grab those and kind of get an idea of maybe are there some risk factors that you may not appreciate uh, for either of those issues. Um, and then, you know, any sorts of uh, looking whether or not there's any seizures. So this is sort of the difficulty sleeping, agitation, um, obviously blank, uh, you know, staring spells, things of that nature, where it would, would be suspicious of potential seizures or some abnormal EEGs that might warrant more investigation. Um, so then in the second visit, uh, basically, so we order whatever the appropriate tests. We're going to talk about kind of some of the more particulars in a minute. Uh, but then, uh, you know, we try to evaluate what, you know, as we start some interventions in the meantime, obviously, if you're brand new and you don't bring, if we don't have many labs to begin with, then sometimes we'll start with some fundamentals or some, uh, you know, just core sort of supplements or things to just to try to get sort of the ball rolling. Uh, we may not get as much bang as we otherwise would, but at the same time, I'm not necessarily sure what I'm treating. And so to me, I use the analogy of the, of the foundation of your home. No, you never see the foundation of your house unless there's a problem, and then it's not gonna work. The rest of the house is not gonna be stable. And so sometimes having those foundational supplements just to get started if you hadn't already, and there's a lot of the vendors obviously out there that you know good multivitamins, omegas, probiotics, some of these basics uh, are good sort of starters just to kind of go, uh, you know, start going with that. And then what we do is we try to see what went right or, where, or right. How's that for optimism for you, right? It's supposed to be right or wrong, sorry, is a typo, I caught it later. So uh, I just, we, you know, I guess she's, we're just very optimistic. Went, went right or went right? Um, it's like that T. Harv Eker guy is like, yes or yes? Um, I don't know if you ever heard any of his lectures. Um, we go over all of the tests. We try to give you a fairly detailed explanation as to what you have gotten, uh, for better or for worse. Um, one of the things that you do see on a fairly regular basis is when we do get certain tests back, Sometimes it's very difficult to predict what you're going to get with these kids. I mean, I've had kids where I would have predicted it would have been a, a mess, and they've been relatively unremarkable, and kids that really weren't that bad that the testing was a mess. So there's, it's always a, a crapshoot as to what you're going to get with the testing. But one of the things I think it's also important to keep in mind is as you are doing testing, sometimes it can be a little disappointing to have normal values or relatively normal testing. Um, and it's, it's disappointing for us as well because we want to be the heroes and we want to have some easy things to fix. And, you know, if, you're, if, if you know, things are terrible, I have a lot to work with. And so it makes me, you know, it gives, makes my life simple, right? Um, but at the same time, when you do have a normal test that comes back, I would encourage you to try not to get discouraged, even though it's like, oh, I just spent 300 bucks on that and it was normal, uh, which is understandable. But if you've ruled certain things out, that's one less thing in a certain sense that you have to worry about. That may not be the big driver. And again, the other thing it's important to remember is there very often isn't a singular driver. It's going to be a lot of little things that may come together collectively. So a lot of people are still stuck in the silver bullet mentality mentality because that's what we've been trained as patients, consumers, and as physicians that there's the silver bullet and I just have to match the, you know, the bug to the drug, so to speak, you know, fix it, you know, uh, find it, blame it, and tame it, right? And sometimes it's not that simple. So in that regard, but if you can say, okay, it doesn't look like we have a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction, okay, good. That's a good thing. Uh, or maybe we don't have a lot of gut in, um, imbalance. Okay, and on it goes, because then we can narrow it down and we can keep drilling down to try to find the pieces that are out of balance. Then from um, there, and, you know, then we'll decide, you know, what new treatments we're going to be uh, using. And obviously, if there have been good uh, improvements, then you can be a bit less aggressive. Um, sometimes if the kid is a little bit older or we're not getting as much mileage out of some of the stuff that normally uh, reacts, they get kind of lovingly called the tough nut kids, uh, then sometimes you have to be a little bit more aggressive. And that's a journey that every family goes on uh, when they're doing biomed uh, because most folks, you know, want to start with, and, and, under, and rightly so, want to start with sort of the least uh, intensive sort of therapies as possible. Um, but there's a balancing act that has to be had and obviously we want to get 
get um, these kids better as quickly as we can. And the, the joke or the example I use on a fairly regular basis is if your house is on fire, uh, the fire department comes and puts out the fire, first and foremost. Then you try to figure out why the house started on fire. We don't tell the fire department, wait, 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 <laughs> you know, don't put the house, don't put the fire out. Let me, let me see if it was, you know, did we leave the burner on or whatever. So there is a balancing act between the immediate need and then the long-term strategy in terms of looking upstream and what root causes. And so trying to find that, and that's very much a, an individualized sort of decision tree that at the end of the day is your decision because this is your journey and we're just here to walk the journey with you. But at the, it's your journey. Uh, you know, you're the one that has to take the, your child for testing. You're the one that has to put the supplements in his smoothie or, or you know, whatever it may be. Um, in terms of the various biomarkers that we'll use, so biomarkers are things that we're all familiar with, uh, looking for just to give us some clues as to possible imbalances. Um, and this can be a number of things. Endocrine is obviously the hormone system. Um, again, immune uh, dysfunction or dysregulation. Uh, the gut obviously is a huge piece of it. Uh, potential for toxicity. And then again, the mitochondrial dysfunction. So some of the stuff now, for those of you that are new and maybe you are still seeing your regular practitioner um, and haven't gone and seen a MAPS doctor yet or a DAN doctor, however you think of us, um, these are a lot of the sort of basics that you could potentially get done through your conventional doctors. Um, and you don't have to have a specialty lab as such uh, to get it done. And these are important. Um, you know, doing biomed isn't only about doing fancy, uh, exotic, uh, non-covered tests. That's a huge part of it. But you can certainly do a, f a fair amount of testing with your doctor. And I would encourage you, honestly, in, in terms of expediency, cost, all of that, if you can get your doctor to agree to a lot of these sort of basics ahead of time and you have those given to your, the doctor that you're going to be seeing before that you even land, already you've eliminated an entire group that we can drill that much faster. And or you, on that initial visit, you know, your pediatrician or your family physician may not necessarily think of certain things as relevant, whereas we may. And so even out of the gate while we're doing more advanced testing, we might tell you, hey, why don't we increase the iron, the vitamin D, or whatever it may be. Whereas your normal, your normal doctors are going to say, oh, it's fine. Um, whereas we'll maybe disagree. So, you know, things that you can see, I mean, in the CBC, the complete blood count, you're going to see whether or not the kid's anemic. A lot of these kids are obviously terrible eaters, and they certainly don't want things green. Um, that's the, the, the god-awful greens, right? Um, and so a lot of these kids are very anemic. Um, if you have abnormal, you know, usually uh, low white blood cell counts, you may have a chronic viral infection. Platelets, again, with for inflammation. Um, eosinophils are the type of white blood cell that basically... Uh, we see most commonly with allergies, uh, potentially parasites, things like this. So you can get a fair amount just from basic CBC. And then the comprehensive metabolic panel is going to look at your liver function testings, kidney. Again, is the child acidic? And therefore, we would maybe be suspicious of... Um, uh, again, mitochondrial dysfunction, things of that nature. And so, or if the liver function tests are abnormal, that can sometimes be a clue as to maybe there's some toxicity that the liver is having to deal with because it's elevated. So these are the little clues that sometimes you can get just from basics. Um, similarly, magnesium. A lot of these kids are very low in magnesium. Uh, mag is one of my favorite supplements. I just, it just does wonders for so many things. Um, I think every, they should just put it in the drinking water. Uh, it's certainly, it's a calming supplement generally, and so it's the kind of thing that you can give for to help with sleep, anxiety. Um, kids that have asthma type things, it can relax the airways a little bit. It's good for headaches. I mean, it does a lot of really great things. So it's it, identifying and addressing an underlying magnesium deficiency, and it's very very, very common. Um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but there's a huge percentage of the population that's deficient because our food supply in the topsoil has become deficient in magnesium, regrettably. Um, similarly, with uh, the zinc, uh, if the, the zinc is low, you're going to not have um, as much attention. There's sort of, again, another little cliche that says no zinc, no think. Um, and so uh, zinc is an important cofactor for so many of the biochemical pathways that um, being low in that, just, it, just things just won't work. 
Uh, again, other various minerals, chromium with, uh, with pica, lithium with irritability. Lithium is a difficult one to uh, test because generally the blood test isn't terribly helpful. Uh, it's going to be basically non-detectable for the most part. Um, sometimes we'll get a little bit better sense of lithium through some of the hair testing that we'll do. Um, lithium, I love lithium. It's, it's kind of funny to use this stuff because it scares the heck out of a lot of people. Uh, for some reason, you know, they'll, they'll put their kid on 10 thousand times the normal dose of folate or methyl B12 or something like that and not bat an eye uh, or you know something like that but you can tell them to put this little itty bitty amount of lithium for calming and you know they think they're you're going to poison them or that their kid's bipolar or something like this so it's an interesting thing but it, it can be very helpful for the right kid um, iron um, again we do try to test ferritin um, excuse me one sec Ferritin is the iron store, um, and so a lot of times your regular doctor is going to want to do just a CBC. Uh, we find that the CBC is helpful, but not necessarily adequate, um, because it doesn't tell you about kind of tissue levels of iron, and the ferritin is as close as we can get to that. And when they're low in their iron store, then they can get these various symptoms, you know, insomnia, restless legs, and so forth. And, you know, a lot of the conventional labs have really, really wide bands of ferritin, for example. The norm for Quest Diagnostics, for example, is 5 to 100. And so you go to your pediatrician and you say, hey, you know, I, wanna, I went to this crazy conference and I heard this doc and I want to test the ferritin. And you get it back and it's 6. And your pediatrician will say, okay, you're good, you know. And it's kind of like, well, if you wear a size seven shoe, then you could, are you going to fit into a size five? Are you going to fit into a size nine? I mean, it's, you're not going to really fit. And so having that really low iron storage is, even if it's technically normal, is not optimal. And so we'll try to optimize some of these things. Uh, again, ferritin being one of those. Um, similarly with cholesterol, a lot of people get a little confused when we'll order uh, fasting cholesterols because they're like, well, are you worried my kid's gonna have a heart attack? And it's like, no, we're not worried about that. Uh, not yet. Uh, what we're looking for is actually low cholesterol levels because low cholesterol levels have been associated, as you can see, with irritability and aggression and so forth. And so we will actually supplement kids with cholesterol tablets if they're sensitive to eggs or they won't eat eggs. Otherwise, we'll just have kids eat a couple of egg yolks every day just to get that cholesterol level up. And then we just have to monitor it to make sure they're not overshooting. Um, testosterone levels, uh, obviously, and maybe like a preteen or a teenage boy. Obviously, little kids, it's not generally it's going to be as relevant. Uh, but you know, as we all know, testosterone equals aggression, um, and so that. And there's, I believe, uh, Dr. Usman uh, later today is having a whole talk about that. So she'll go into that in a lot more detail. Um, the TSH is the hormone that comes from the, uh, the pituitary gland, uh, it's the thyroid stimulating hormone. Again, looking for some hypothyroidism, um, which is, the thyroid unfortunately is a little bit of the canary in the coal mine um, gland. It does tend to get affected fairly rapidly when there's other imbalances, and so it's not necessarily uncommon for you to have, or these kids to have, maybe not true blue hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's disease or those things, but you do get a lot of these kids that have suboptimal functioning of their thyroid. And so again, that isn't going to make anything work well. And that could be because of inflammation, that could be because of adrenal stress, that could be because of zinc or selenium deficiencies. There's a number of ways for the thyroid, unfortunately, to get hurt. And so if it doesn't work, then again, this can uh, contribute to our symptoms. Vitamin A levels, again, is something that when you have a kid that's a very strong sideways glancer, you know, uh, the deficiencies, you know, we'll try to look at that and we'll try to shore that up. And not always, but very often, it tends to get a lot better uh, when that gets uh, addressed. Uh, cortisol is your kind of the stress hormone. And so, again, looking for low levels if, you know, sort of that whole adrenal fatigue, uh, you know, adrenal, you know, the adrenal glands will go through sort of this whole, and this is again where the kind of the conventional endocrinology community doesn't necessarily agree with it because they don't think there's anything wrong until the, the adrenal glands are destroyed, uh, you know, and you have, uh, you know, Oh, uh, just blanking on the name of the syndrome. But basically, it's like what JFK had, uh, Addison's disease or something like this. Um, you know, but, you know, the integrative medicine, functional maps, all these docs that do this understand that the adrenal, there's, there's a lot of stages between being completely blown out and, um, and being completely well-functioning. And so sometimes looking at cortisol levels can be helpful to help, help us assess that. 
Um, thyroid antibodies, again, you know, looking for Hashimoto's. Uh, again, back to the thyroid, uh, various thyroid hormones for the similar reason. And then again, vitamin D levels are very, very often low in these kids. And so we'll try to get them on relatively higher doses to try to help, you know, increase, uh, you know, mucosal barriers, oxidative stress, things like this. You know, vitamin D is one of those, it's a vitamin, but it's a hormone and it does a lot of different things. And so we'll try to optimize that. And these little things, even though they don't sound like much, it adds up. It's really interesting to see. Um, for immune dysfunction, we'll look at IgG levels uh, in very, you know, some of the different uh, IgM, IgA. Again, looking for, is this an immune driver? Uh, do we have immunodeficiencies, uh, things of this nature? Um, IgE is associated, obviously, with allergies, as you can see. Um, and then the, on the opposite side of the, of the immune spectrum is going to be more of that autoimmune, inflammatory kind of thing. So when you think about the immune system, it's, a, it's sort of a bit of a teeter-totter. And, you know, the, the immune system's job really is to sort of decide who is friend and who is foe, and its number one job is tolerance, basically. Um, so if the immune system loses tolerance to other, where it shouldn't be bothered by a certain thing, then you get what would, we would call kind of more of an allergic kind of situation. If the immune system loses tolerance to self, then you're going to get more of an autoimmune situation. And so the tricky thing with the immune system is trying to find balance, and that's really what it dry, you know, ultimately boils down to. Uh, so things like uh, a screening test for autoimmune would be the anti you know, the ANA. Uh, a CRP and a SED rate uh, are, again, nonspecific markers for inflammation. Uh, so again, when we see these things elevated, then it can help drive us a little bit where we say, ah, we need to maybe really hit this kid with more anti-inflammatory type uh, remedies, whether that's going to be a curcumin or a broccoli seed extract or, you know, whatever it may be uh, to try to, you know, a pycnogenol, some of these things to drive inflammation down. Um, the folate receptor antibodies we tend to do a lot of in our office. Um, this is uh, associated with cerebral folate deficiency. Uh, basically, the blood-brain barrier has receptors where the folate has to get through. And if they have antibodies that can either block or bind, as it obviously says, uh, that receptor, then the folate uh, won't get through properly. And so sometimes you have to use these supraphysiologic doses folate. just to get it into the brain. Um, and so looking for those antibodies can be very helpful because then that can tell us, hey, we need to really drill down in this and really get this kid on very high level folate. And we need to potentially, for example, get them off of dairy because that, or any kind of milk or animal product, uh, these kinds of animal products, because that tends to be a big driver for those antibodies. Um, and here, and this is a little bit more information on that. Again, the, two, the blocking and the binding. Um, and again, you know, one of the study by Dr. Fry, uh, it, he found that about 75% of kids with autism had at least one of these antibodies. And there is a vendor outside that does, is sort of the main uh, vendor that tests that. And you can ask me after the fact uh, if you want to know the name of it. I have no affiliation with it or anything. Uh, and then, but without treatment, they can get worse, unfortunately. So it's good to identify it and get the root cause done. Uh, more immune dysregulation, the ASO and the anti-DNA is B. Um, everyone is very uh, hot to trot right now for pans and pandas. Uh, it's sort of uh, the it girl uh, at the moment. Uh, there's going to be a couple of lectures, I believe, on Sunday by Dr. O'Hara about, I think it's called Pots and Pans uh, is the title. Um, so it's a very hot topic at the moment. This is basically an autoimmune of sorts reaction to having a previous uh, strep and or uh, viral infection. Um, and and so screening and addressing those can be very helpful uh, to try to see if we need to either treat it, get the kid on an antibiotic, or again, some other anti-inflammatories, uh, because that will be driving a lot of the brain issues. And again, you'll get a lot of information on that if you want to attend those lectures, if you're suspicious for that. Um, the anti-gliadin is going to be, again, antibodies for celiac and then food allergy and food sensitivity panels. It says allergy here. I try to be careful about not calling the IgG testing an allergy test. We, you know, that really should be most uh, appropriately named a sensitivity test um, because a true allergy test is going to be the IgE testing. That's the one that your regular doctors can do. The IgG testing is admittedly controversial uh, because it changes very rapidly and so there's a lot of arguments as to the relevance or lack thereof, even within the integrative medical community, is how, value the, how valuable those tests really are. Um, I don't think that they have no value. I think they can be very helpful if you're absolutely clueless. You know your 
kid's reacting to something in their diet, for example, you just cannot figure out what it is. Sometimes it can give you a clue as to maybe, you know, surprising. Like one time I ran uh, one of these tests on a, on a kiddo of mine and, um, you know, the king came back negative for like pretty much everything. And I felt really bad because, you know, it was like a $300 test. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I felt bad for the mom. And like, the I think one of the few things that was positive was Apple, you know? And so I was like, and so mom went with it and she went home and took out, he liked apples a lot. He was eating a lot of apples and she took the apples out of his diet and he got a lot better. Now, was it the phenolics in the apple? Was it the IgG? You know, I don't really know, but it was an interesting thing. And so when, when and I did a follow-up and I'm like, how's it going? And she's like, oh, it's a lot better. And I'm like, oh, okay, what'd you do? And she's I took out apples like you told me. I'm like, okay. Uh, so sometimes they can be valuable, but again, there's a little, you know, I always put a little caveat to that test. Um, and again, here's where we're talking about, you know, the IgE being more that immediate, that, you know, eczema, allergies, asthma, those sorts of things. And again, the IgG testing is going to be those vague things, right? My tummy hurts. I'm not sleeping. I'm agitated. I'm stimmy. Uh, you know, you know, I get, you know, just any of that kind of stuff. Those tend to be a little bit more IgG driven as opposed to IgE. So you just have to know what you're looking for and then test, you know, the appropriate test. That's all. Um, and again, diagnosing that, you can do the skin or the RAS testing is the blood test. Uh, IgG, again, is, can either be done through a finger stick or, again, a, a regular blood work. Um, and again, if you do have a lot of IgG coming back positive, sometimes you'll get kids where there's a whole lot of everything going on. It's not any one thing that's really standing out. But, you know, sort of a little bit of everybody is kind of showing up. That can be kind of traditionally thought of as suspicious for a leaky gut, um, where you're getting just too many of these, your immune system is seeing too many kind of intact proteins, you know, it's reacting to it, it's creating antibodies. And so the thought being that maybe you need to work a little bit more on um, kind of healing and sealing the gut. And then hopefully then the immune system no longer sees those food items. And therefore, maybe then we would have less uh, various negative behaviors and so forth. Um, but again, the gold standard is an elimination and re-challenge trial. That is really, at the end of the day, the most best way to do it. And it's free, which is always nice. Um, in terms of, and then this is just talking more about food allergies and autism and, and so, and this sort of thing with the, uh, cow, uh, the cow milk diet and I, uh, the lecture before me was talking about the gluten and dairy free diet, I believe. So I'll just sort of pass through that. Um, other things we can do is looking at the poop. Uh, we do poop all day long. We love it. The kids get a big kick out of talking about it. Um, and there's a lot of different markers. Now, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, can I do the poop test through my regular doctor? And the answer is yes and no. You can certainly do certain tests through them. But what I try to tell people is that the, the, the comb with which the regular, like a Quest, LabCorp, some of these sorts of uh, conventional labs co uses is generally too broad. And so you're going to miss a lot of the subtleties um, of any kind of gut imbalance that you may be worrying about that are commonplace with kids with autism. Doesn't mean that you can't do things like a, a calprotectin level through a regular gastroenterologist. You can do stool cultures, these sorts of things, absolutely. Um, it, will your regular pediatrician do it? Probably not, but your, a gastroenterologist may do some of them. However, there are other subtle things that will not typically be tested and or covered because they're considered experimental. And so that's when some of the other um, stool tests through the other vendors, you know, some of the vendors, you know, for example, that are outside are going to be a better bet. They're really um, going to be, if you're really looking for the gut, you really want these sorts of tests. They're going to be much more um, sensitive to try to pick up things you're potentially worrying about. So for example, again, calprotectin is a marker of inflammatory bowel disease. And again, that is something you can get through a regular doc. Uh, eosinophil X is going to be something that is, eosinophils are again those allergy cells. So in that sense, you know, looking, uh, do we have an allergy trigger in our gut and causing problems? Um, and then looking at, you know, the bile acids, the digestive enzymes through the elastase, um, butyrate, you know, some of the short chain fatty acids as the food gets fermented in the gut by the gut bacteria, is it, is it looking healthy or is it not looking healthy? I mean, we've all gone to the, uh, the bathroom after someone else went to the bathroom and not that it ever smells great after someone has, who has gone, but there's sometimes, you know, grandma who is very sick has gone to the bathroom before you 
and it smells like something died in there versus, or some of our kids, right? I mean, it's their stool smells, you know, there's poop and then there's poop, you know, it's foul smelling. And so those gassy kind of smells um, can be uh, suspicious for, uh, you know, some gut imbalance that might need to be addressed. And then doing stool cultures and microscopic exam to see if there are particular pathologic bugs that we need to address. Um, so this is a slide just showing some of those markers uh, from one of the tests uh, where you can see the calprotectin level is relatively high there. And so that's worrisome. You know, you've got a lot of inflammation in this gut. Um, and again, it's a very common issue. Again, we talked about kind of the leaky gut intestinal permeability. Uh, and, you know, they're very common in autistic patients, uh, as you can see here, uh, compared to normal controls. Uh, and so also, and then sometimes people are reluctant to go on the gluten and dairy-free diet. And if you, you can see here in the bottom, uh, kids that were, did do that diet did have lower intestinal permeability tests compared to those that were just eating everything and anything. Uh, there's, I think, by now a lot of research that people are becoming increasingly comfortable with and familiar with that concept of gluten and dairy and these sorts of things, uh, gluten in particular, uh, being very pro-inflammatory, can overstimulate the immune system. Inflammatory chemicals come out, do a lot of collateral damage, and then what that does, it, it really hurts the intestines, and then you can get the kind of that proverbial leaky gut. So as much as it is an inconvenience to try a gluten and dairy-free diet, um, and you know, let's face it, gluten-free bread doesn't taste very good compared to the real stuff, um, but at the same time, it can be very critical for a lot of these kids, especially if you have a lot of gut issues. Um, this is one of the cultures that would come from one of these sorts of companies uh, where you can see uh, down sort of uh, at the top, you don't, you're not growing really any lactobacillus species. So again, we need to replete that uh, through supplementation just to try to get things kind of up and running, get some good guys in there. And if you look sort of under number 13, I don't have a little pointer, uh, you see a lot of these sort of PPPPPPs. These are guys that, you know, are, means potential pathogens. And it doesn't necessarily mean the example I give a lot when I try to explain this is that I look at the gut as sort of a coral reef of sorts uh, where it's a little internal ecosystem. And so it's, if you go to Hawaii and you're going snorkeling at a re on a reef and you see a ton of sea urchins, it's not that it's an elephant that's there that's like, what is this doing here? Sea urchins belong on coral reefs. But when you see a disproportionate amount of, of sea urchins or a lot of mildew or that kind of that green kind of filmy stuff on the reef, it's then you start to go, there's something that's out of balance here. There's too many sea urchins. So either the conditions are growing too many of the sea urchins or the predator that kills the sea urchins is somehow either being overfished or gotten hurt. And so therefore it's, had too, it's out of balance, more or less, this little, this little ecosystem. So sometimes we'll try to treat those to try to address it and get the gut back in balance. And then below the mycology is gonna be a similar idea, uh, just but with fungal species, whether it's candida or otherwise. And then what we do is when you have those sorts of agents, they will give you sort of the uh, sensitivity testing to see what will work best. So the S means sensitive, I is intermediate, R is resistant, and uh, you know, R, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, and then that helps guide us uh, in this particular uh, deck, uh, it's showing more prescription stuff. They will also give, um, in the testing, they'll frequently give herbals if you're not wanting to do a pharmaceutical. Um, and I believe there's a picture of that coming. Uh, same idea, just again, another bug, Proteus, uh, Klebsiella. So a lot of times if you're gonna do um, any sort of uh, med or, and or supplement, we'll try to find common threads. So for example, you know, you would look at something like this and say, okay, you know, if I've got, if I wanna treat this Enterobacter, you know, okay, it's susceptible to that last one at the bottom, the trimethoprim sulfa. Okay, good, next one. Hey, look at that. That one's also susceptible to it. You know, whereas if you look at the pattern, you know, the amox like augmentin, augment, uh, amoxicillin, those probably wouldn't work with this guy. They would work with this one, but you want that common thread. And again, then we go to this guy and say, hey, Klebsiella also sensitive to the trim sulfa. Okay, if I'm gonna do a prescription, that'd probably be a good choice. I can maybe blast three guys with one bullet. And I like that. Okay, um, and again, a similar sort of idea with the antifungals, if you're gonna use antifungals. 
Um, and again, no, I, I thought there was an herbal one. Most of these will come back with some herbal uh, options as well if you're more inclined to try more of a berberine or a grapefruit seed extract or um, you know silver or some of the things, they'll, they'll also make some suggestions on there as well. So those can be helpful if you didn't want to do pharmaceutical stuff just yet. Um, another thing that actually paradoxically can test GI dysfunction is the organic acid test. This to me is, you know, one of the most fundamental and usually if I can only get one uh, biomed test, you know, uh, from, a, from a kid, at least for the first pass, I'll usually try to do an oat test. Um, and what that can do is I look at the oat test as sort of like when you get your car um, smog checked or you have to get it, you know, they stick the... They stick the big uh, thing up the uh, up the muffler uh, to see kind of There's how running and if you're polluting the air and so forth. And what it does is it's really nice because it can give you a lot of the me metabolic footprint for yeast, for the various bacteria, clostridia, things like that. It also can give you markers of mitochondrial dysfunction. It can give you neurotransmitter metabolites as the neurotransmitters, the dopamine and the norepinephrine and the serotonin and all these things are being built and destroyed. They're coming out in the urine. And so in that regard, it can give you a nice snapshot as to maybe where you may want to look deeper. And so it's, I like it a lot. I think it's nice. It's also non-invasive, which is obviously great. And it can be a nice little screening test of sorts. And it can also pick things up that maybe the stool testing will miss. Because for example, you know, clostridia is an anaerobic, meaning it can't live in air. It is very, very difficult. You can't really get it in a stool sample. So it's not going to be a very reliable test. Similarly with the yeast. And so sometimes if we can find them in the urine, because as those chemicals go from the gut through the gut wall into the blood, kidney, and into the urine, you can pick that up, whereas you would miss it on the, on the stool test. You know, if you drink a glass of wine, I can detect the alcohol, which is a yeast metabolite, in your urine where I wouldn't necessarily detect the yeast in your stool. I mean, it's not an exact example, but just to kind of make an analogy. So in that way, the organic acid test can be very, or potentially be very helpful to pick some stuff up. And then it also, a lot of them have various nutrient markers uh, that can also be a good clue. You know, methylmalonic acid or, for me, or there's something called fig glue for folate. There's different things that we can look at to sort of give us some ideas. Um, I don't think this turns out very well, but this is an idea of like one of the, the uh, local uh, vendors that do this. And you can see that whole first grouping there is a bunch of the yeast markers. And you can see there's quite a few, there's three elevations. The arabinose is pretty darn elevated. So this would be a kid that we would be suspicious for yeast issues and want to kind of hit them accordingly. Um, the next group is the bacterial markers looking for some dysbiosis and some imbalance. And the lowest group there, if you look at that, those are clostridium markers. Uh, for example, the 4-cresol is elevated, and that shows a kid has a fair amount of C. diff uh, going on. Um, and so, again, it helps guide us a little bit if we need to do some stuff in the gut. Um, looking here, this is the mitochondrial markers. Again, looking at elevations. Do we have elevations in the mitochondrial markers as the mitochondria are not working well? Then we're going to get these offshoots. It's kind of like if there's a, a traffic jam or an accident somewhere on the highway and all of the the feeders or all of the off ramps below that are all going to suddenly have a lot of cars. And so if I have a traffic jam at a certain point, and let's say I had the ability to, te to detect, you know, this off ramp and this off ramp and this off ramp, and suddenly there's a lot of cars on those off ramps, I could, I could deduce that there's something blocking the traffic past that. And so I may not be able to detect exactly the traffic jam or the accident on the freeway, but I can say, I can surmise that we're going to have one there because of the other uh, off ramps. And that's kind of how these work a little bit. Um, again, ketone and fatty acids, again, more mitochondria. And then you can see there the nutritional markers. Again, looking for some, it's a similar idea, just, you know, different biochemistry um, in trying to sort of look to see if we have risk factors. Um, same sort of idea, you know, looking for some screening tests uh, for possible markers of, of detoxification need. Um, and so, again, they're not perfect tests. These are very, you know, nonspecific. It doesn't tell you exactly, oh, if I see the 2-hydroxybutyric, that it means my kid has heavy metal toxicity or something like that. It just says, hey, we're chewing up a lot of glutathione here for whatever reason it may be, and therefore we need to maybe investigate further into this, into this silo. 
Um, again, GI dysfunction can be very common. I gotta hurry up, I'm almost out of time. Uh, but uh, constipation and GI dysfunction is gonna be a, a huge piece that needs to be addressed very early. Um, if you're constipated, nothing's gonna work if you, you gotta clean out the garbage chute. Um, and consumption of milk, again, yet another reason to cut milk down. Um, you can see this kid, as we lovingly call as FOS, full of stool uh, and lots of lots of poop in there. These are kids that need pretty aggressive clean outs, and it doesn't have to be Miralax. There are many, many, many things, even though you're trained, I'm sorry, any pediatricians in the audience, I love you, but a trained monkey could write Miralax. Um, I don't understand why pediatric gastroenterologists are writing Miralax for long term. There's so many other things that could be used. Um, you know, it, it's just not, it's rarely necessary to go to that extreme, in my humble opinion. Uh, but getting that cleaned out is gonna be really, really critical. Your kid will feel better, they'll get less aggressive, and you can start doing the work because if they're not moving their bowels, and let's say you want want to detox them, uh, they could be toxed to the roof, but if you start mobilizing all the toxins and they can't get rid of it, they're just going to reabsorb it. And so you really have to do things in a proper order before jumping in and doing, you know, aggressive detox, uh, you know, at least in that sense. And then looking at kind of, well, you know, the lovely Bristol stool chart, uh, the, the, the kids always love seeing the poop diagrams in the office. Um, markers of toxicity and heavy metals. Um, again, uh, when you do hair kinds of things, like the blood, I'm sorry, is more of an ongoing recent exposure. So again, those are rarely, unless you live in Flint, those are rarely super helpful. Uh, um, you can do the packed red blood cells, which are a little bit better. Um, and then the hair metals we'll use as a screening test for the last several months while the hair's been there. Um, and then kind of the better, gold or more gold standard is things as doing eventually uh, some toxic metals tests, urine tests, maybe even uh, you know doing some chelation to sort of pull some of that stuff out. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail on Sunday um, in terms of looking to, you know tissue level sort of toxins. Um, this is a, uh, a heavy metal test that is a provoked urine, and you can see the lead and the mercury are rather high, and that was after a chelator, something called DMSA. Um, again, mitochondrial dysfunction, there's going to be a few lectures on it. Uh, again, this is a mitochondria, and uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm probably not going to be able to get into that, unfortunately. But basically, more or less, if you look at the top band, that's called the electron transport chain. What it does is that the body takes carbs, fats, proteins, puts them into this TCA cycle there, that little round circle, and what it does is it spits off different um, elect, uh, chemicals to make the electron transport chain at the top work, and it creates a battery, more or less. That So at the end, hydrogen ions basically can get pumped back in, and it creates energy for the cells. And so when you hear someone taking carnitine, uh, that thing in the lower right is the shuttle that gets the long chain fatty acids in. If you hear someone taking CoQ10, ubiquinol, ubiquinone, you see up there on the top, that's a little shuttle as part of the electron transport chain. So these are some of the things. And then the FAD, NAD, these are all vitamins. These are B vitamins. So these are why we try to put all these things into these kids to try to help shore that up. Um, some of those biomarkers is, again, and these are tests that we can do basically through a regular lab. Uh, ammonia, lactate, CK, these are all going to theoretically go up with severe enough mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, some amino acids, and again, you have the handouts, so I don't need to read it to you. Um, but these are all, every single one of those things, save the organic acid test, can be done through a regular lab. You can get an organic acid test through a conventional lab, but it's not gonna look for a lot of the same things. It's not looking for the, the yeast and the clostridia and those sorts of things. <clears throat> it's more of a pure metabolic dysfunction which is not wrong, but I've had a lot, I've had quite a few parents who, in order to save a couple of bucks, have tried to get that done through a, their geneticist or whatever, and it's fine, it's nothing wrong to do it, but then they're a little bit irked because then they're like, well, where are the yeast markers? And I'm like, there aren't any. That's not what it's looking for. Okay, so just kind of know that these kind of oat tests, as opposed to the, the regular oat tests through a geneticist, are gonna have some overlap, but not exactly one in the same. Um, these are different uh, uh, risk factors that, um, in some studies with Dr. Rosignol, Dr. Fry uh, for mitochondrial dysfunction. And we actually have a, a paper at our booth um, where there's even like a little questionnaire and some uh, handout where you can even read more and kind of look to see if you're maybe at risk or your kid is at risk of having some mito dysfunction. 
Um, and then seizures and getting the 24-hour EEG. Um, a lot of the EEGs end up being, you know, 40 minutes uh, or sedated or whatever. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that's just simply not enough to pick it up. So if you can really try to push for that 24-hour, that would be very helpful. And it doesn't have to be true blue seizures. Sometimes you can still, about two-thirds of kids are going to have an abnormal EEG, uh, whether about a third with having actual seizure, another third with some just abnormalities, but it may be red as normal, and then another third third where it's pretty much clean. Um, so here's kind of a summary slide of things that you could potentially bring to your loving doctor and say, you know, bring them a box of donuts or whatever uh, to sort of bribe them to do it for you. And uh, if you're at Kaiser or you're in HMO, you're going to maybe have to slip them a, a hundy or something. I don't know. They don't want to do it. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of them, and honestly, a lot of your regular docs are just simply not going to know what any of this means because, honestly, I'm a pediatrician. I wasn't, I mean, some of this, obviously, we were trained in, but a lot of this, we were simply not trained in it at all, okay? So they're going to look at you a little cross-eyed as well. Uh, so just, just know that to be so. Um, and again, the oat we covered, the CDSA, that's the Comprehensive Digestive Stool Analysis, the hair metals, and then that 24-hour EEG. And again, when to do what also is that is the individual, that is what we try to discern in that first visit to figure out where we can go, okay? But what we do try to do is try to get as much done as quickly as possible to really get things going for you, okay? Um, and then and other considerations, environmental allergies, mold, toxins, genetics, these are all things that are going to be discussed through various people uh, throughout this weekend. So I'd encourage you to go to all these talks because obviously it's too much to cover in one hour. And then um, just stuff, again, you have the slides. So uh, yeah, and, and this is Nicole and her husband and her three kids. So I just wanted to give her her props for her own slideshow. So anyway. And I think that's it, and I think I'm out of time, huh?